Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to introduce Nero Mattel, who is the Director of Editions for Deliveroo, and Amy Mazel, who is Global Head of Expansion, uh, to talk to us about the services and options that they've been developing. And I think it's fair to say there's been quite a lot of dramatic fast progress in recent months. So it'd be really interesting to see what they've got to say and see how the business is, is um, growing and developing. Um, and then we're going to be doing an interview with them as well, so it's an interactive uh, interview, and we've got a whole great panel that will be joining us. So I'll be doing some Q&A once they've finished a short presentation, and then we'll be bringing in the panel from there. Um, look, I think that's, what's really fascinating about this period of time is as we go back, I think most companies are looking at their models about exactly what's going to happen. I think it has been the most confusing time, most challenging time for all operations, I think we all know people are struggling to find the right staff as they re try and do the great rehire across the industry. I think that's been problematic. I think we all know that people coming back to offices in different levels and different sizes. And I think the present forecast at the moment is 55% of people are going to be expected back by October. But is that true? Is that correct? And actually, whichever you go right across the country, whether it's universities, whether it's military, whether it's public sector, everyone is looking at their operational models and what can be changed and what can be done. So I think actually this discussion with Deliveroo today and with Miriam and Amy is actually incredibly relevant and be a real value to, what we, to what's going forward in the marketplace at this time. Um, as said, we want to bring a really expert panel in, which we're going to, and we'll be delighted to have Hamish Cook join us, who is Global Head of Food Services for ISS, Lucy, Lucy Flinter, who's founder, one of the founding directors of Zero Procure, uh, Stefan Devane from Bruin Dolphin, head of kind of food and beverage and front of house services for Bruin Dolphin, and Vicky Latrobe, who is director of Four Point Consultancy, who does a lot of work right across a whole number of areas. So it should be an interactive, fascinating time. Uh, you will have questions to ask as we go, so please feel free to ask in the Q and A button as we go. Uh, this is being recorded, and we'll release that recording as of tomorrow. So after that short introduction, now let me pass you over to Amy and Mira. To do a short to do a short presentation to talk and lay the ground for what we're going to talk about. Amy, can I pass over to you? Hi everyone, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully, everyone can see that. Mira, I will pass over to you. Thank you, Amy, for, for uh, that introduction. What we wanted to do today is talk to you a little bit about um, the additions model. But before we dive into the specifics of additions, um, given it, it's it, you know one player in the wider delivery-only kitchen, dark kitchen market, uh, we thought it'd be helpful to just start with an overview um, of exactly what delivery-only kitchens are, and then we'll talk a little bit about the additions model. So for those of you um, who are, are not familiar with the delivery only kitchens, it's a pretty simple concept in that you have uh, your sort of delivery only kitchen provided um, by your traditional real estate provider. So your, your, your landlords. So they are responsible for, for, for um, get hand, essentially managing the site. So they, they, they sort of have the, the site building. The kitchen, the delivery kitchen provider and additions is an example of one of those is then responsible for essentially running the site. So they are in charge of bringing, um, making sure that the, the construction is done within the site, the equipment is set up. They manage all the site operations to make sure that we have staff there from, from opening to closing. We then, the delivery kitchen provider is then responsible for liaising with restaurant partners who are then bringing in their chefs, their staff, preparing the food, figuring out the menu. So they do what they know how to do best. They manage the food and then um, the the delivery and the third party logistics are then managed by your market or, or your delivery food apps and so specifically Deliveroo plays within bucket one and four of those uh, sorry bucket two and four of those um, and other uh, dark kitchen prov providers who aren't connected with marketplace apps would only play in bucket two. So that gives you a bit of an overview of, of delivery only kitchens. Now let me talk you through additions and the model that we have today. Amy, can you... okay. So um, additions, we started with additions in 2016. 
And it started off as a series of container boxes on car parks. And we built it as a way to help restaurant brands expand into areas where they didn't have uh, physical presence today. And the way it started was we were actually talking to our largest restaurant partners in London. And at that point, delivery was, you know, somewhere between 10, 15, 20 percent of their business. And they would realize and you'd sort of realize just by sitting in a restaurant that it was difficult for these restaurants to accommodate, accommodate both delivery orders and dine in and make sure that they are able to deliver uh, a seamless customer experience in a high quality way when they're man managing both streams. And so what we proposed was to deliver, was to build a delivery only kitchen to segregate both in-house as well as dine-in and it essentially operated as two separate business lines that allowed us to then, or would allow the restaurant partner to make sure that both of those streams were, were executed to the best of their capability. And initially the restaurants were very encouraged by the idea and I actually think that um, it, it was, it, you know, when we went into it, it was an operational problem that we were solving. However, very quickly it became clear that additions is so much more than that. And actually it can be a massive point of differentiation for our restaurant partners. And the reason for this is super simple. Delivery is essentially a content business and it's all about showcasing the best brands to our consumers. And what additions allows us to do is it allows, to, uh, allows us to create restaurant supply where the content is lacking today. So it allows us to bring the best brands and the best content to areas where they don't exist. And initially we would take central London brands and take them to the suburbs. And we saw, and we even continue to see that these um, creating restaurant supply and content where it's lacking is super powerful. And we saw that this would create in incredible consumer engagement, the app ratings are the best on the platform and app ratings is a way that um, consumers feedback to, to, to us on the quality of the restaurants. And so the, the, and the quality, both quality of restaurants and the quality of the experience. And that was highest on the platform for our additions partners. Delivery is faster, so it's four minutes faster, and we're already delivering in 28 minutes. So the customer experience of a delivery-only order is so much more better, it's so much more powerful when it's within an additions kitchen than not. But the game changer was really for the restauranter, because instead of having to think about how do I manage delivery alongside my flooded dining room, they now had to shift their thinking to say, how do I optimize for a delivery only experience. So how do I think about what's the right menu for, the, for a delivery only experience? What's the right packaging? How do I communicate my brand in the best way and the emotional attachment that people have to dine in? How do I communicate that in a delivery only environment? And, and by creating that focus, they were able to deliver the best end-to-end -end customer experience. And the shift in this mindset is so, so fundamental to delivering an incredible delivery experience. So over time, we've seen that restaurants have ended up making more money by moving dine-in into additions and consumers are happier. And then COVID happened and COVID meant that additions became more important than ever before because restaurants were not considering, well, restaurants were starting to think about what is the restaurant of the future look like? And they were no longer thinking additions is a great way for me to expand but they were thinking it's actually a really critical component of my operating system. Um, and so where previously additions might have been a nice to have, it was much more of a must have. And so that's why we see a massive waiting list of restaurant partners trying to get into our, our kitchens. And we're, you know, we're aggressively expanding the number of sites that we're going after today. And we think for this reason, additions is, is a massive game changer for our, for our, um, for our restaurants. So let me talk to you a little bit about what a delivery first operation looks like. So our approach here is really simple. We let the restaurants focus on the things that they love doing and what they're good at, which is creating phenomenal food and thinking about what the next killer menu item is. And we take away the parts of the operation that they don't enjoy as much, such as dishwashing or managing infrastructure or logistics. And we started this five years ago and have worked with world-class kitchen operators to get our kitchens right. And that's no small feat because we've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we lay out our kitchens and lay out our sites so that it works best? How do we make sure that we have the right um, 
the right technical capabilities in our site to manage multiple kitchens operating simultaneously? How do we make sure that the planning is is right? How do we make sure that rider flow is correct in us is you know is is manageable across our sites and that the the impact on residential nearby is not is not uh, too grave? And so we've done a lot of thinking in this place to make sure how do we how do we deliver the right kitchen and the right dark kitchen for the environment that we're operating in the layout and the equipment itself is pretty straightforward but what makes these these sites and these kitchens so great is that we streamline the site design to enable an easy handover to riders and we build software to performance manage things like missing items so the customer experience is really really strong and we also you know we we obsess over hygiene and so we have the best high, we have the highest hygiene ratings across all of our kitchens. So, for example, in the UK, all of our kitchens are five star FSA rated. And we spend a lot of time working with our restaurant partners on helping improve and making sure that we're continuing to hit those higher standards of food safety. Most importantly, perhaps, is the fact that Editions actually works financially for our partners. So they don't incur any upfront capex. They don't have to pay any front of house costs. Their rent is a fraction of the high street uh, sites that they have. Um, and whilst we have a higher sort of take rate or commission rate in additions, our partners are generating profit from these sites today. And given they have no capex, the EBITDA that they're, they're, they're generating is purely incremental for their business. So in summary, additions works for operators. And the proof is in the fact that we have the most quality obsessed brands have expanded into additions kitchens. And they're not, they haven't just taken one kitchen or two kitchens. They've taken multiple. You look at folks like Dishoom, they've got nine kitchens with us. You look at Shake Shack, they've got 15 kitchens with us. This is, these, are, these are big numbers when you think about the share that it represents of their entire portfolio. And, and those are a couple of brands and we have a long waiting list of brands trying to get into, into additions. So the delivery only kitchen space has seen a lot of activity during COVID. But let me talk a little bit about why Deliveroo, we believe, is uniquely placed to win in this space. We think there's four key factors which, which help us win. The first and, and, and foremost is the fact that we have a ton of data on consumer buying behavior, as well as data on brand performance. And so this means we're able to select the best sites and predict which brands are likely to succeed in a particular catchment area. And this is huge, and it's a massive differentiator for us relative to pure infrastructure providers who don't have this marketplace data because if you and we've seen this if you put a brand in the wrong place and if that if that zone or that locality is too crowded for that cuisine type or there's too many other competitors of the same you know high-end burger operator for example those brands won't do well and so so knowing exactly where is the right place for these guys to expand to from a delivery only perspective is super important and having that data makes us makes it really powerful. Secondly, we have we have strong brand relationships as part of being but given that we have, you know, the wider marketplace platform. And so our partners trust us and we have a, tr a strong track record of being the number one player on, on restaurant satisfaction. Third and, and maybe the most important is the demand generation that we're able to directly um, manage for our restaurant partners. So we 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 actively showcase editions brands in our apps. Um, when it, when an edition site launches in a in a zone, we spend we spend a lot of time and energy, you know, marketing it to our consumers throughout the life cycle of the editions brand and the edition site. We we continually um, we continually market alongside our restaurant partners, and we make sure that we surface those brands in our app because we ultimately know that this is the best content that we have in that location. And in turn, this drives greater demand for partners. And being a being this sort of full stack provider of have, helping site um, helping brands be you know helping brands in the site selection, the infrastructure, the software, site management, demand generation, logistics, having that end to end service is what makes Edition so powerful. And it's essentially a one stop shop for brands, and that's why they choose us. And finally, for for, for editions and delivery more broadly. Editions allows us to go after and, and sort of optimize our PL because once you have multiple brands in the same location, um, the site is optimized for delivery. And so you can reduce things like rider wait time, you can batch more orders, you can operate more profitably. And, and ultimately, that benefit we're able to share with our restaurant partners as well. So it means that 
we're, we're not a, not only is, is additions a, a sort of a valuable pay for, for delivery, but it means that um, as part of being a marketplace, it's the, the, the incremental benefit that we generate is something that we can we can share with our restaurant partners. So, so, so to finish up, let me take you through an example of what uh, the additions business has done for, for delivery overall. Um, so Dubai is a really great uh, proof point. It's a huge success story for us. Um, and additions has been a really key part of that. And it's a differentiator that basically none of our competitors really have. Uh, so we have uh, three sites. We, we, we're just opening a couple more, but we have three um, fully ramped up sites in Dubai. And on the left, you can see um, where exactly they're located. And, and you'll see that the, the, um, the colors around those sites are, are essentially what we call the catchment of those, si those sites. So where those sites deliver to. And you can see that pretty much these sites cover you know, the majority of the city. And in those sites, we've dropped some, you know, excellent exclusive brands. They're often Western brands that are highly aspirational that consumers couldn't have otherwise in Dubai. So things like Five Guys, Pickle, Royal China, to name a few. And the delivery experience in these sites is phenomenal. Like the, the we deliver seven minutes faster than our marketplace orders. Our MPS is nine points higher. Um, this is in a market where our service, our normal service on marketplace is already very strong it's, and it's a strong differentiator. Um, so, so to have additions do even better than that, it's a, you know, it's a great success story. And the impact it's had is that additions has, has grown to be nearly, you know, one in 10 orders on the platform. And our, our Dubai business has grown exceptionally fast and we're taking market share from local incumbents um, very quickly, and that in, is 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 no small part due to additions and the the growth that additions has been able to generate. Um, so, in a way, the way we think about additions is it's it's almost like a strong we bring strong anchor tenants to a neighbourhood that can drive a flywheel, and it it becomes the reason that consumers flock to our platform. Um, so, in conclusion, we believe that additions is is a huge reason why delivery is exciting for our cu customers. It gives them content that they can't find on any other platform or they couldn't find on their local high street. Um, and that's why it's something that we are we, we're super excited about. It's something personally that Amy and I spend a lot of time obsessing about. And it's it's something that we're looking to grow uh, broadly across many markets in our in our delivery portfolio. So I wanted that we wanted to finish off and give you a bit of a flavor of what one of our newest sites looks like. So this is one that we've actually opened um, just a couple of months ago in Dubai, in fact. So we'll give you a bit of a flavor of what what the, the site looks like. And some of the folks that have been working closely on the site, they've got a few words to say as well. So over to you, Amy, to, to play the video. I can't put in words how proud I am. It's been quite a journey to get this one up and running. The evolution of what we've achieved, it's absolutely fantastic. So yeah, this being not just the largest one that we've ever built, but also the most advanced one is incredibly inspiring. We're really bringing exciting new selection to the area and customers that have moved into, for example, a new development in Sport City can now access their favorite brands from downtown, etc. So we're really trying to give the customer the most consistency as possible no matter where you are in Dubai. In terms of reach and impact, we're very excited about this site. This is our fourth site in Dubai. And in terms of catchment, we are very proud to say that we have two sites within the same area, which is Blatsha, which has proven to be a very strategic area for the business. People are at the core of our business. Yes, we deliver food. We always try to do it faster. We always try to do it better. But ultimately, it's people. And you have to treat people the way they want to be treated. And that goes as far as providing our chefs and our side teams with staff areas, for example, throughout the site. And at the same time, it also means providing our riders with an environment where they feel comfortable, where it's temperature controlled, where they've got access to refreshments, where they can even sit down and take a little bit of a break in between. All those elements are incredibly important. For our restaurant partners, we provide them the ability to scale very, very quickly at minimal cost. So there's no capex or barely any capex, and there is no opex or barely any opex. And very lastly, for our riders, given that the site is fully geared towards delivery, they're able to go in and out very quickly. So pick up an order and leave. And as you can see, we provide them with everything here to be able to take a break, have a water, clean their masks, clean their bikes, clean their boxes to make sure that they provide the best service in class to our customers. And all of this wouldn't have been possible without the work of 
our incredible team, and I'm just so excited to see what this team does to deliver on our future plans. Thank you, Amy. Um, so I, I guess just to, just to conclude, on the page here, you'll see that there's a, there's a handful of some of the biggest brands that we work with. Um, and and these, are, these are brands largely in the UK, and many of these are in multiple sites. So as I said before, Dishoom is in nine sites, Shake Shack is going into 15 sites. Um, many of these are in, in you know, high single digit sites across, across our portfolio. So it gives you a bit of a flavor of um, the type of brands we partner with, but also the value that we're able to add to these partners because they're willingly taking on multiple sites and being sort of the anchor tenants as we expand our additions proposition. And before I, I will I will conclude there and just leave this on the screen for you to to just mull over and read. And these are some of the comments that the um, the, the senior folks at uh, some of our brands have come away with and, and talked about in terms of the value that uh, additions and delivery only kitchens are, are providing for them, uh, particularly during the lock, lockdown and then and and thereafter. Thank you. No, thank you, Mira. That was excellent. Really good. Apologies for the technical hiccup at the start. Don't so, worry, right, because these things happen. We get used to them, to be fair. Very natural. Um, let's bring you both in. Thank you for that. Look, you've obviously been through quite a quite a journey over the last few years. And I guess this listening to you, that starting in 2016 is probably heightened in pace, I assume, during the pandemic. But how has the model evolved over recent years? Yeah, so um we actually when we started in 2016, um, we were putting down container boxes in car parks. And these were, you know, 10 to 10 to 12 container boxes. Um, each restaurant partner had a container box. We'd fit that container box out as a kitchen, and we sort of had a separate dispatch area. And riders would come to the car park, pick up the orders, and go. And and through just doing this, what we've learned is we've learned a number of things. We've learned how to build kitchens that accommodate the volume of partners that we're trying to do. So if you think the, the model has evolved away from container boxes to brick and mortar sites, but we need to make sure that we have the right technical capability. And Amy can talk a lot more um, fluently than I on exactly how we think about the technical specs, but we need to make sure that frankly, when you've got 10 operators running at full tilt on a Friday night or a Saturday night, our, our kitchen can deal with that. But we've also got to be mindful that we're, we're in areas that given that the proposition is about bringing phenomenal content to consumers, our sites are in the middle of where consumers live. It's where consumers want to be. And so we need to make sure that the way that we think, both in terms of when we select a site, but also the way we build it, it's it's um, it's cognizant of our surroundings. So it's cognizant of the residential that's close to us. It's cognizant of um, the rider movements that we have going on in the area. So we've done a lot of thinking in this space to make sure that whenever we open a site, it's we are, you know, we're essentially good neighbors for the people that are around us. Um, and that's super, super important because I think this is something that, this, is, this for us is not like a two year play. This is a long-term structural advantage that we want to deliver in these localities. And I think that was interesting during your presentation. I think that came across very loud and clear, the amount of thought that's gone into all this planning. Yeah. Probably much more than people expect. It's also, it's also not a, a simple thing to crack because I think when you do it, um, you start to realize some of the, the the, the the questions and the things that could be trickier and as you start doing more and more and the problems we face are different in different markets and it's different in London versus you know rest of the UK for example and 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 the density of the population makes a difference so having having done this quite a few times now we're pretty versed in okay well what will work what won't work what are some of the red lines that we're just not willing to compromise on because we know that ultimately we want to make sure that, that this is a site that lasts for years and it's something that works for our restaurants as well as our as well as our uh, you know local communities no, I think what, one thing add, so, so, sorry again. sorry chris there's a little bit of a delay so i, I talked over your apologies um just just to add to that as well is that um i think oh, particularly over the last like 18 months and we've started to see um these these huge players uh, restaurant partners that you see you saw in the presentation that are now working with us um we've learned so much from them as well and so we've had to from a, from a build perspective we've had to adapt very quickly and get their understandings of what they need from a site as well 
Um, and like Mira said, when you start to add three, four, eight, ten of those partners, those large partners in one site, making sure that we have that that infrastructure, that kitchen layout, that general site layout that is optimized for um, such high volume partners has been tricky. And so we've had to we've had to adapt very quickly, take all of their learnings, have a really close feedback loop with them to make sure that the, every time we build another site and we're designing another site is that we we are continually evolving that that kind of physical model as well. No, that's fair. And what's been your greatest learnings during this period of growth? I've lost your sound again, Mira. You there again? No, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll answer a couple of build ones. Yeah, you one. go through what we do, yeah. Yeah, so I think, um, like like Mira mentioned, was that um, one of the one of the greatest learnings that we found is as we've as we've built this estate over the last, particularly in the UK, over the last kind of um, you know four or five years, is that um, we we learn so much, like I said, from our restaurant partners, but also from our operations team, um, and also from just the general environment that we're in. And so what we found is that. It's, it's so important, like Mira said, to be that good neighbour and that we've had to then improve our early processes from a site feasibility perspective and design to make sure that we are that good neighbour, um, that, uh, that we're not disruptive, that we are you know, welcomed in that community. Uh, and so the way that we design, um, that, that we select and design a site has had to evolve over time. Um, and so... That alongside, uh, you know, planning applications and feedback from EHOs and, uh, you know, planning officers uh, is continual. And again, we have to factor that into every one of our new builds. So with, whether it be from a, uh, a noise attenuation point or an odour control point or the way in which that we uh, manage riders in a car park outside of our, our, outside of our site, uh, all of those pieces um, and that, that continual feedback loop with the, you know, with from an institutional perspective, whether it be, you know, fire departments and building control through to, um, you know, that restaurant partner feedback and our operations feedback um, means that we will never, ever sit with a static model. Like we, this is never going to be done. Uh, everything's always going to evolve. And as those order volumes increase and as we have more opportunities from a, um, from an ancillary product perspective. So for example, if you ordered a, uh, you know, from a five guys from us and uh, you could also add in uh, a Ben and Jerry's tub of ice cream, for example, you know, all those bolt-ons and all of that learning, all those kind of commercial opportunities will continually mean that from a physical perspective of what we need and what our site looks like will continue to kind of evolve. And Mira, you can talk much better from a, a wider business perspective if the sound is working. Yeah, is that yeah. better? Yeah. yeah, it's better. Thank you. Um, uh, saved by Amy, thank you. Um, the I, so beyond the build thing, I think a lot of as we've as we've grown over the over the five years, this this desire to make sure that we deliver the best customer experience it has become, I mean, front and center. And so initially, it was about how do we improve app ratings, how do we improve missing items, so make sure that like you actually get what you ordered, and there isn't any of that. Um, you know, you know, the the product you order, you get, and there isn't any. Um, you know poor quality food or any of that sort of thing so how do we make sure that we create that that um clear structure and process in place in our sites and then over time that's 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 um changed into like how do we make sure that uh we have the fastest prep, you know we are we are super accurate on prep time which allows us to make sure that our um our riders are delivering orders to you faster than 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 on the core platform how do we make sure that um, the emotional uh, engagement that happens in a dine-in restaurant is is transferred to our delivery experience? So if you, if any of you guys have uh, an addition site near you and you're lucky enough to have a Dishoom, I'd recommend that you you definitely order from it because what you will see is that the packaging of the Dishoom, both in terms of the bags, but also like the boxes that food comes in, it, it shouts loud and clear about the brand. It's not, it's none of that is, you know, shouting about delivery. It's all about communicating what Dishoom is to our customers. So these are, these are some of the things that we've started to continue and, and we continue, and there's a lot more for us to do, but how do we make sure that we're communicating that emotional experience that we all have di in dining and transferring that to the delivery experience is super important. 
No, it's really interesting. Now, we've got a couple of questions coming through, which I'm, which I'm just to quickly pose you. Firstly, there's interesting. There's interest in which cities internationally you're working in. Because um, yeah. that's growing over time, isn't it? Yes. Um, so, so we have... Um, yeah, we're, we're present in eight uh, in eight markets. So we're we're present in in the UK, and when I say UK, I mean like really we're 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 in London and some of the major cities in um, in in outside London, but growing pretty aggressively in in probably most of the, the big cities. Um, we're present in France, in UAE, and in Hong Kong. Uh, those are sort of our main anchor markets and our biggest growth markets. We're also then present in um, Spain, uh, Netherlands, uh, Singapore, and Australia. And future expansion, any particular areas you want to focus on? Yeah, the, the biggest markets for us are going to be the UK all over, France all over, UAE, uh, and I would say sort of the Middle East region, so UAE, Kuwait, put those markets together, and then Hong Kong. Okay. So that leads on nice to the next question, that which has been posed by Peter, Peter Backman, was saying that when you first, editions first launched, it noted you wanted 200 sites in the UK. What number are you at the moment? And is the 200 still achievable? So we're currently at uh, 35, 36 sites globally, um, of which we have about 15 sites in the UK. So we're not, we're not quite at that 200 number, but, but I, would, I would focus less on sites and more on kitchens because it's about bringing content to consumers and kitchens is what each kitchen is a different brand. So we're at, we're at, um, over two hundred and fifty kitchens at the moment. Um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, grow that considerably this year, um, and then we've got big expansion plans uh, next year and the year thereafter. So this this trajectory of growth means that we will you know the, the, the will more than more than surpass our current uh, our current um, estate size. I think to add to that as well is that we'll, you'll see from the existing estate, particularly in the UK, that historic estate of, you know, over the last few years, there's smaller sites. And so what we're finding now is that uh, all of the sites that we are working on currently and that are in the immediate pipe are much larger sites. So like Mira says, these are, these are um, double the size of kitchens, num numbers of kitchens per site than previously. So we're, we're bringing those kitchen numbers up, but maximising kind of the, the, the space. That's lovely. Now, I had a question here about who to contact to discuss possibilities with you. So, Amy, shall, shall we do the, you as the introduction? Is that best? We'll yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, and I will filter out. Yeah, of course. Of course. Great, lovely. We'll, we'll deal with that afterwards. So, thank you for that question. Um, next question is Do addition kitchens typically offer the same menus to regular kitchens? Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, we offer we offer a similar menu in that often what you find is the dine in menu is. is um, it's obviously very long and uh, detailed and you have, you know, all the different starters, mains, desserts, etc. cetera. Um, but the delivery only kitchen is much smaller than the dining kitchen. So it's somewhere between 21 to 24 square meters. And so in that space, you just can't do all of those items. And also all of those items are not the items that sell well on delivery. So what sells well on in dining is very different. Um, to delivery and so we spend a bunch of time with our restaurant partners actually helping them look through their menu based on the experience that we have of other brands in the in, in that cuisine both in additions and on our core platform to say okay well what what items do we think are going to work um, and we also help them not only think about the menu itself and the individual items but also how do you think about bundles and group um, group offers and what offers are going to work better in a dining, in a delivery world, than a dining world. So it's a it's a much more what what I would call much more focused or tailored menu to the delivery only environment. Now the next thing I'd like to just touch on is what value does additions bring to the real estate owner? So that's yeah. quite a key part of this, isn't it? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, if if you go back to the point of of what does additions do for the the neighbourhood that it's bringing in. It's all about it's all about um, the content that we're delivering to our consumers, and therefore the value um, that that content generates. And it means that our consumers are, are um, you know, using our platform more. They're more excited about uh, delivery and, and additions because of the, the the value that those those brands bring. I think if you're a if you're a um, a hospitality provider or a, a hotel provider, what we've seen in the past is like actually dropping some of these brands in. To, to a hotel it's not only about servicing 
consumers in outside of the hotel, but it could also be about servicing room service or the dine-in in the um, in the local uh, hotel. So, it, so now it's not only you, you not only have a, you you don't I mean you don't have your standard in-house menu, but you have three or four phenomenal brands. So you, I mean, you could be offering someone a Dishoom, a Hakkasan, a Shake Shack. Uh, I mean, that brand, that selection itself is pretty, is pretty impressive. I think just to add on a tangible perspective as well, is that, that we invest very heavily in our sites. And so we take pride in that we, we have a, you know, very high quality kind of build. And so there's a, there's a great level of infrastructure that, uh, that we fund that is then, you know, improves and uh, improves the value of kind of the asset. Um, alongside, you know, we are looking for, we're looking for longer term leases, you know, so we are a very secure kind of um, partner in that respect as well. I mean, it leads on nicely to the next question is what do you look for in a property? Yeah, it's a good it's question. It's not clear cut, is it? It's not no, clear it's cut, not. It's not. We have, um, I mean, we have we have a series of property specs, and I won't bore you with all of that. So, if anyone's interested, we can we can obviously share that. Um, it it, re- it really varies. Like we are, and we're pretty adaptable, is what I would say. So, we our, our bog standard, if you like, is is a typical industrial box, and that's what we've done historically. And it's somewhere in the region of three to five thousand square foot, and you you sort of carve that up into kitchens with a bit of dispatch area and and dry and cold storage and staff room, etc. But that's but, but we recognize that a that's that's sort of um, how we've grown to date, but that's not necessarily the only model for growth going forward. So we're actually we're, we're super flexible. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get brands and multiple brands in a kitchen and we, we have segregated kitchen space. So we essentially have walls between each of our kitchens. Um, but having said that, we, we, we I mean, we've we've worked with hotel. We are working with hotel providers right now and we can make existing kitchen space that they have work as well. So we're pretty flexible. And what I would say is like we, we're willing to we, we should have a discussion on on a on a sort of a specific basis. If there's if there's players who are who are interested in partnering, partnering with us. That's great. And the future was a huge hole for you. What's your aspiration for additions? Yeah, it's um, the sky is the limit, is what we say at, at, at additions. Um, th- I think we've we've spent the last five years really iterating this model and refining it and making sure it works well. I feel I feel like we we feel comfortable and we're we're in a good place that we have a model that works. And for us, a big part of the next one, two, three years is is going to be around expansion, and it's going to be around um, taking the model that we have. And taking it to more localities or mo- more zones within our within our markets, but also adapting our model and, and bringing you know advancing it in the future. So there will be, I, I imagine there will be um, there'll be we, we will no longer just be if I look sort of three four years in advance in in the future. I don't think our our estate will still be industrial boxes. I think that will evolve and we'll have a greater mix of different types of real estate within our portfolio i also think the way that we will um manage our sites will also evolve so um the amount of when we're already thinking about this the amount of technology we put in our sites that the data we give back to our to our restaurant partners the way that we work with them to improve operations that is like a continual feed that we're trying to you know continually automate and then i mean never say never but i i wouldn't be surprised if at some point we have some element of robotics in our kitchens because that's what you're starting to see is like kitchen robotics is becoming more and more mainstream if you like and that could be the next evolution of what an addition's kitchens like looks like so there's i think a ton of innovation and thinking going on around how do we make our sites um best in class or you know the forefront in the delivery kitchen market um and then i think there's also the real estate that we will look for and our portfolio of real estate will also evolve. Oh, it's really interesting what you're talking about data because actually many companies are data rich but they don't use that data often very effectively. Yeah. Actually, one of the, one of the advantages perhaps is working with you is that you seem to use data or you seem to spend a lot of time focusing on that data and how you use that data. Is that fair? Yeah, it is. And it's the, the one thing I'm, I mean, when I joined Delivery, you know, just over, over 18 months ago, the thing that really struck me is like, just the amount of data we have and and the data is really at our fingertips so you i mean you can you can see trading from last night 
very, very quickly. You can see trading in the last hour. And that's not just someone senior can see it. That's like available to the organization. So the amount of data we have is very, very rich. And then we, we, we spend a lot of time harnessing that data, both in, in terms of helping restaurant partners figure out what is the right location for them. But even when they're live, we have our site team members um, looking at data constantly and looking at performance from yesterday or the day before or the week before and saying, okay, this is where we've done well. This is where the restaurant partner can improve. And we spend a lot of time working with them and coaching them to help improve operations and, and improve the way that they think about their kitchens and managing their kitchen and managing the flow of orders into their kitchen um, so that it's optimized for delivery. Now, before I bring the panel in, final question, what surprised you most about your journey so far? Each of you. Yeah, I think, um, uh, let me talk a little bit about what, uh, related to what we've learned. I think when we started out, what, if I compare what our goal was when we started out versus our goal now, it, it is it is different. And I think that journey that we've been on has been, if you like, a bit of a surprise. Because I think when we started out, we put these container boxes down and it was really about going after independent restaurants and, and sort of your mom and pop shops and bringing them into, into um, new locations. And what we found is actually brand recognition is so unbelievably important. And so um, taking, you know, Mira's kebabs and moving it into Walthamstow, for example, it's just not that interesting and customers it's and it's not interesting for customers it's not it doesn't work for the restaurant partners and so this this um this point of brand recognition and making sure that that, that customers know the brand is super important and there's so many levels to that like sometimes there are national brands like say nando's and wagamama's which everyone knows up and down the country that that works in many localities but then there's also i, I mean like take take Dishoom, for example that's a brand that people know well in London and people know probably well in Manchester and Edinburgh and, and big cities but they probably don't know it as well in other more rural or less populous areas and so actually thinking through when does a brand work and when does a brand not work is something that we have over the years spent a lot of time thinking through and so and that that sort of goes into the data that we s share with our our restaurant partners when we're talking to them about where do we expand we spend a lot of time thinking okay do we think this brand is going to work is there enough recognition for that brand will they have to t spend a ton of money in building their brand presence will we have to spend a ton of money in supporting them and if if so that that maybe isn't the right equation so it's something that we've definitely we've definitely learned and, and it's probably it's been the biggest surprise versus what we thought the mission of additions would be when we first started that's interesting amy how about from your perspective I kind of echo, not as a cop out, but I'm going to echo kind of Mira's <laughs> point there is like when I joined, you know, four and a half years ago, have you? Um, uh, the brands that we were working with and were designing sites for, I didn't really know. Um, and, and that was fine. And that was, that was part of the journey. It was, you know, like, like Mira says, that it was all about, um, you know, giving and creating brands almost and giving these smaller brands a, a you know, a larger platform. Uh, and now the biggest surprise for me is just seeing the names that we're now working with, right? And uh, I, I couldn't have imagined that we'd be in a place where we'd be designing a site for, you know, five guys and Shake Shack and, uh, and Dishoom and these guys. Um, and so that has been a very pleasant surprise. And to see that that's, it's not one, what like Mira said earlier in the presentation, it's not a one-off, right? Um, they're, they're signing up for multiple sites because it's, it's proven that it's working um, and that we we are the platform and we are the infrastructure that that supports them at the level that they need to expand. And so that, that's that been the biggest kind of surprise for me is that, um, yeah, that, that just the names that you keep seeing is, is fantastic. But, it, but it's also, it must be a good way of getting growth during this difficult time. Yeah, and it's it's great it's great growth for the restaurant brands because it's, it's mm. because when Edition started, it was sort of um, a source of expansion, if you like, and it was a way to separate out dining and delivery. And now, I mean, it's not, it's not just that. It's like people think about delivery and dark and additions and dark kitchens as like a key component of their operating model and their operating system. So it's not just maybe I'll open a few sites in areas where I'm like wanted to go into, but I don't have brick and mortar. But it's more just we need to we need to capture this growing delivery trend and recognizing that what works on delivery is different to what works on dine-in and having 
having the PL and the infrastructure that's tailored to delivery is how you make it work. And so the, it being a big part of people's operating model has meant that brands and big brands are saying, I want to open three, four, five sites in a go. Um, can you help me do that? No, and these not. brands are, no. I mean, these, these brands are growing internationally is the other thing I would say is like, you, you look at, I mean, you look at five guys, for example, in that list, they're in, um, they're in Dubai and, and Paris with us. They're coming into the UK. You look at Shake Shack, they're in, you know, Hong Kong and, and London. So they're, they're seeing the benefit not only in one market, but they're like, okay, well, how do I do this and grow in my other market um, as well, where additions is also present. So having that, that global presence helps us as well. Yeah, no, absolutely logical. Uh, can I bring the panel in now? Vic, Vicky, Hamish, and Lucy, can I bring you in at this point? I think Stefan is having problems, I'm afraid, so it's down to the three of you at the moment, I think. Hi, Vicky. Hi. Uh, hi, Lucy, Hamish. So just to reintroduce you, Vicky, uh, you're the director, obviously, of uh, Four Points Consultancy, and you work with a whole range of different clients across a whole range of different markets, mm. from public sector to private sector to attractions. Uh, Lucy is one of the founders of Zero Procure and works right across the hotel and restaurant sectors, I think it's fair to say. And Hamish Cook is head of foods, global food services with, for ISS. Uh, welcome. Um, Lucy, shall I start with you? Um, yeah, you hi. Thank you for having me. Um, this is about people and culture, actually, and not necessarily to do with supply. So common perception of dark kitchens is that it, it's now reducing the creativity of skilled chefs who may ordinarily work in restaurants like Deschew to now working on kind of a factory production line. And the finesse of that service now re redeployed to zero hour contract bicycle couriers. With interest in the reputation of careers within hospitality at an all-time low and the industry experiencing a severe staffing crisis, what will Deliveroo do to support recruitment drives and culture change within the industry? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think, um, let me start by saying, like, I, 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 I don't think that working in a delivery-only kitchen is, um, is limiting creativity because, um, like I mentioned earlier, what... what the menu that works in a dining kitchen is different to the menu that works in a delivery kitchen. And so thinking about how do we adapt that menu and some, some delivery only providers and some restaurateurs actually have items on their menu in the delivery only space that they don't have in the dining space. And they sometimes even use delivery only as a way to trial new items. So, so as restaurateurs and as delivery only kitchens become more and more embedded into the way that that restaurant um, uh, restaurateurs operate. I think it's almost a complementary service, if you like, and and I think it can be as much a a creative, new idea generating, new idea trialing opportunity as your dining world. Um, the other the other thing I would say is in terms of creating jobs, um, delivery delivery only is no it, 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 like I mentioned earlier. It's no longer. It's no longer nice to have. I mean, it, it, it's a must have. And with with dining potentially struggling and some restaurateurs having having closed sites, delivery only is becoming a bigger part of their their business. And so that that growth means that there are, you know, a whole bunch of chef opportunity roles created. There's a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, of new jobs created through the delivery only infrastructure, if you like. Amy, any thoughts on Lucy's question? Yeah, I think um, just to add further, I think it's just that um, it's become evident. It's a question that we con continually get asked from a, a planning perspective is that, um, uh, that everyone's very interested in how many jobs are we bringing to that community? And when we're talking about these sites that are like 12, 14 kitchens, um, we're bringing like 60 plus jobs to that one particular site that's at an operation and at a um, you know, not non-rider, non-delivery rider, you know, specific. Um, and so I think this is, this isn't, this shouldn't, I don't think this should be taking away jobs from any other sector or, or, or devaluing any jobs. This is, this is literally allowing, I think, that the, the, the restaurants to continue doing what they do well in the dine-in space, but also um, enabling them to, to focus on that and that customer experience within the restaurant is then not hampered by the influx of, of delivery orders that the kitchen is still trying to pump out as well. This gives them that opportunity to, to kind of segregate. And that's what Deschume do really well, 
is that they separate their delivery and their and their dining operations so that the dining customers get that that amazing experience that you kind of expect and hope for when you go out. But equally, if I want to order the stream because I'm, I'm at home, then they have a facility that's in the same catchment that is just focused on, you know, a quick, slick operation to get you food to your, to your, to your door. And can I just, just add on to that, that obviously that is great that the jobs are being created. Um, but what is it that you can do to help um, encourage people to work within those create jobs that you're creating? in partnership with those restaurants that are using your kitchen yeah so it's it's we do we spend a lot of time with our restaurants helping them and and the the chef turnover and all of that turnover that the dining restaurants experience we we experience it with the same with the same brush i think um so i think we we spend a lot of time a working with the restaurateurs to say what how do you make sure what what is the right delivery only menu what are the right skills and capabilities that we want um, of the chef team to to operate in our uh, delivery only uh, kitchens and then um, we often I mean we, we often see sometimes the chefs that work in our delivery only kitchens may over time go into the dine-in operations of those restaurants and that frankly that's great right because this is this is one restaurant this we want to make sure that we are we are translating the Deshume experience to our customers. It's not the delivery experience. It's not the additions experience. It's a Deshume experience. And if 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 that means that we have a Deshume um, chef in our delivery only kitchen and, and they sort of migrate into the to the to the dining restaurants and vice versa, that should be an ecosystem that is that is uh, continues to live on. And and we we were able to translate that um, across the two pieces. Thank you, Good. David. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Hamish, can I bring you in at this point? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, really interesting sort of uh, overview, Amy and uh, Mira. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm sort of interested to just sort of understand, uh, you know, a little bit perhaps about, you know, the evolution of, of additions perhaps into the future because it seems to me that, uh, you know, what you're, what you're doing here is you're moving away from perhaps a, a delivery sort of model which, you know, relied on sort of perhaps more local small partners to sort of bring big brands into sort of, as you would say, you know, mass production um, type facilities owned and, and run by yourselves. Now, how do your traditional partners, you know, the, uh, perhaps the smaller operators in those areas sort of feel about you setting up shop and bringing, bringing some really big global brands to sort of compete with them? Yeah, it's a... It's a really, it's a really good question. It's something that we actually wrestle with internally because obviously, additions being part of a marketplace, you, you don't favour additions brand. You can't favour additions brands over over your core marketplace brands. Um, and ultimately, having the selection uh, and the combined selection of what additions provides because additions is only ten kitchens, right? And if you're in a locality. You don't always want to shroom shake shack hackathon. Sometimes you want something else. So we need to create an ecosystem which has um, that works for, for both the shroom brands as well as the core marketplace brands. And what's really interesting and what we've seen is that actually Deshume, think about it a bit like a shopping center. Like Desh, um, these additions kitchens are, are what we call like anchor tenants in the neighborhood. So you drop in an additions kitchen, and what you find is these brands mean that that it's actually now exciting for consumers to go on to the app and start ordering and 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 these brands not only themselves drive more customer acquisition but more importantly for the zone overall it drives increased um, frequency and increased retention so the other brands who aren't on in additions they're actually seeing the benefit of the additions kitchens because they're seeing that customers are like okay well actually delivery has got a greater variety and it's got brands that i love but it's also got, got my local favorites and so they're going on and ordering both more so and then the other thing i would say is like just that the, the headroom of the market we're operating is it is so great like we have we're right at the start of this delivery journey and the penetrate if you look at some of the penetration numbers um it's much more nascent today than many other online services so i think the growth opportunity is there both for the additions brands and the non-additions brands. Um, but actually having those additions brands in these locations actually helps drive that flywheel and benefits the core marketplace brands as well. Good. Amy, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I don't have anything else to add from, from, from that, to be honest. That is, that is uh, 
yeah, I, I've got nothing else of value to add to what we were just saying. <laughs> I'm sure you do, but yeah, that's fine. Um, Vicky, can I bring you in this point? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm interested in and exploring a little bit further your uh, what you were saying earlier about potentially how the model may change going forward or how it may adapt. Um, I work with a number of public sector clients who now increasingly are planning to develop hubs, regional hubs in multi-tenant in buildings, which would traditionally all have had their own kitchens and probably worked with a third party contract caterer. They are increasingly no longer building kitchens. So they are relying on alternative solutions. Now, these are significant regional hubs. But obviously, this is a different approach. It's less about necessarily about brand and more about a bespoke solution that meets their requirements. Can you see a day when you may work either almost in a B2B environment where you're creating a bespoke solution for that end user? Let's say it's the government property agency or where you might then work with a third party to create a portfolio solution that ticks all of these more bespoke needs. Yeah, it's a it's a. Um... It's it's a great question. I think the short answer is is yes, but we would we wouldn't. I don't think we would see it as just uh, a solution to that B two B. So take your multi tenanted building. It wouldn't just be for those those operators in that building. Um, and, and and to be completely frank with you, like these are conversations that we have with not only government organisations today, but like other other big um, national or you know. A, a, a culture a, a big big, big organizations that have that are removing their dining services and want to have some sort of aggregated solution we would absolutely be open to working with folks to figure out okay well what is it that your b2b brands or what is it that your your captive tenants want today um and what brands is, does that look like and how does that marry with other brands or the other customer needs in the wider locality um and how do we bring that two together? Because I don't think it I don't think it's just purely a service that that needs to be restricted to providing for, for folks in just that building. We've we've actually got on a we've we've had a couple of uh dabbles with that and, and we've got a couple of um live examples that we've been looking at. And what we've kind of found is that um like you say, there's a it's a very different customer, right? And it usually works in the favor that actually that one facility can cater very well. Uh, for that usually day part and equally then the addition site works perfectly for uh, that typical night kind of uh, evening evening trade so it does work it can work really well and just as a quick add-on to that question how remotely could you see this model work obviously it would be a variant of the model but coming away from a major urban hub how far do you think you could push this out into a remote a more remote area that really requires this kind of service and possibly wouldn't be able to generate it any other way yeah i think um, i think pretty remote to be honest and 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 um we've done a bit of modeling internally to, to say actually the benefit of additions is that it drives this flywheel um so so you pop down these restaurants and a bit like I was sort of talking, saying uh, in response to Hamish's question, it sort of, you pop it down, it drives a flywheel and actually it generates demand because of the quality of the restaurants that you can put in. Um, now, if it is a much more remote location, we might not put in 10 brands or 20 brands. It might be a much smaller number of brands uh, because you just, that locality can't, can't um, accommodate that many brands. But there's definitely adaptations of this model that we're looking at, which means that how do we, how do we bring the service to, to more of our customers because ultimately the mission statement that we want to deliver is this is not just a, a London solution or a big city solution this needs to be this needs to be a model where it works for customers wherever they are and they should be able to get the best content regardless of where they live um, and so that's why we think we'll need to continue to evolve and iterate this model in a way that works for for different population sizes thank you Lucy? Uh, that, that, the, the questions were kind of answered for me it's been really interesting to learn about it and uh, you know certainly for the remote side of things and to Victoria's point there's lots of uh, companies and uh, you know we're looking at in-house dining for example staff feeding that will look for these solutions um, for reducing their their capacity in their building so it's really interesting to hear your model uh, can expand. Has it, has, it, has it surprised you today? 
of interest? Uh, to be, yeah, I have to admit, it's um, yeah, it has, it has, it has. Um, yes, my cynicism is slightly better. The other, um, I guess, yeah. the other thing that I would just say, Lucy, to your earlier question, in terms of like, how do we add value? Not quite to the hospitality sector, but something that we're we're doing more so with each of our sites is we have um we have a community budget um, with every single site that we open so some for example like some of our sites are are in particularly in london are, are in industrial locations but those industrial locations as you, you guys will know is like there's a school nearby or there's a university nearby or that sort of thing and we're really we're really keen to make sure that whatever we put into our our communities we also give back locally to folks um who are there so we we do things like um if, if, a, if a school has a food tech program, for example, um, and, and students want to come in and, and learn from chefs or want to do cooking on site, we're, we're really open to like, how do we collaborate more openly with, with other players in the local community that, that we can add value to as well? The, the one thing I would like to add is that the cynicism will still remain within the hospitality sector, within hotels, because the partners you're working with at the moment, you know, Dishoom will, will use this to scale its brand brilliantly without having to then take on extra capex in, in locations. Um, a lot of your other brands are the fast food, grab and, grow, grab and go markets. Um, the, there'll be a lot to do to convince the hotel sites that you're not there as that threat because the hotel restaurants are obviously really struggling within their own small brands um, and won't have that opportunity to scale. So, you, you know, that business, um, into, for them to compete in that market of offering both the in-house dining and the delivery section, which is, is in such high demand, that, you know, I, I, I really implore delivery to, to work with those partners to make sure that they're being supported Supported, um, because not all of those hotel restaurants from the luxury section down to the mid scale will, will want to scale to the size of a Shake Shack and a um, Five Guys. Um, so there is still that middle ground to be made and friends to be made within the hotel restaurant sector. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's fair. And I think some hotels we've seen have actually said, I'd rather replace my in my dining brand with these brands and then you sort of have you almost structure it where you have the addition I mean you have the additions brands operating out of the kitchen they go and do some delivery but they can also service the in-house customers so that you know you have a, a menu which has you'll just assume your Hakkasan your Shake Shack for example and folks can can deliver can order from that so you're you're, you're moving away from as a hotel person you're moving away from doing the dine-in and you're leaving that to the brands like those that we have in in, in additions. Um, but obviously if the if the hotel themselves were like, actually we want both of them to coexist, we, you know, we can have a discussion about how does that work and what what space would our brands take, what space would their brands take, how do we co-market those, how do we present that to, to hotel uh, you know, in-house guests so that they're, they're able to have the select the full selection. Um, so there's definitely opportunities to collaborate if, if the hotel decides that they want to keep uh, their in-house dining as well. We, we actually had a, um, actually a very good conversation with a, uh, a large hotel in London about that specifically, where, whereby they had under, underutilized space, right? So it wasn't like a, they weren't having to decide between losing their dining. Um, it was more about, look, this was they, they were they were viewing it as a um, we'd rather use additions for the room service, allowing us to fine tune our dine in experience. And actually, they wanted to use this as a um, as a take of okay, well, we're going to actually change what this is, refine it, and they wanted to make this more fine dining, for example, and then leave additions to to cater for a slightly more casual element. Um, but it was all about a, a collaborative piece of saying okay we need to ensure that the brands that we bring to that particular location are complementary to you um, to make sure that your offer remains as your priority one and that how do we complement you as opposed to being in like direct competition or you know threatening your your, your dining piece yeah. so definitely, definitely like conversations to be continuing and those conversations like your wonderful video would be really great to share with the, with the community to, to show that you know you are supportive of not not killing off some of those you know smaller in-house brands that hotels have worked really hard to develop Absolutely. thank you lucy thank you um can i bring lauren in here because i think you've got a question for stefan who's obviously struggling to get on 
Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Um, sorry about that. Yes, Stefan was just struggling with his Wi-Fi. But he's got a great question for, for you, Amy and Mira, um, with regard to staffing. So you know very well, the hospitality industry, we're struggling substantially from a, a staffing crisis perspective. But delivery is doing brilliantly from a growth trajectory perspective. Um, we know restaurants are closing because we don't have enough staff, not enough chefs. So, so Stefan's question was really about how are you overcoming this problem? Um, what are you doing at the moment? What are you doing in the future? And what advice can you give the rest of the, of the industry um, for, for those that are struggling? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think, and I'm, I'm probably going to give an unsatisfactory answer, which is, we, we've, we, I mean, to be frank, like our additions kitchens are are not um, immune to any of this. So we we also have. I mean, we it, it, we're sort of the brands are the ones who are are responsible for for the food and the chef. So they're. I mean, if you're like if you're if you're faux and you've got you're struggling with staffing in your dining, you're also probably going to be struggling with staffing in your additions kitchen. So we, uh, in terms of how are we getting around it at the moment, um, we're sort of working with the restaurateurs to to think through. Okay, if it's if is it a temporary problem how can if can we really leave it a little bit by maybe we, we close for a few days in our addition sites or we delay launch to allow to mean that it doesn't impact dining and they they can they can um uh re, re, you know repurpose those chefs for a short period until they're able to hire um and and frankly we don't there isn't like a i mean i don't have a silver bullet or a good long-term solution i think we're, it's something that we are we're experiencing alongside our restaurant partners and it's something that we're, we're actively talking to our restaurant partners about and i think we have a sort of a wider restaurant services team that thinks about solutions for our restaurant partners so i think it's on the roadmap for them to think about how do we how do we support our restaurant partners both in additions and on our core platform in, in the areas that are concerning to them, of which, you know, staffing is one of those. Thank you. That's great. Hey, Mitch, can I bring you back in at this point? Um, yeah, look, I'm not sure I've got uh, too many more questions. You've done a, a brilliant job sort of answering most of them. Um, I, I would be just sort of interested to understand a little bit more detail about where, where you are sort of currently operating in the UK. I mean, you sort of mentioned London and perhaps some of the other major cities. Are you... You know, yeah. at liberty to sort of say which major cities no, and no, things I'm like happy, that. I'm happy to share. Um, I'm happy to share. So in the in in uh, outside of UK, we're currently in um, Cambridge, Reading, Brighton, uh, Manchester, Nottingham, and Leeds. Um, we are, and then within London, I mean, we're not within Zone One, if you like, or but we're sort of. If you start thinking about like Swiss Cottage, Islington is like zone 2S, we go from there and like radiate outwards. Um, and in terms of expansion, we're sort of continuing to radiate further outwards in London to cover, you know, the wider zones from from three onwards or two, three onwards. Um, and then outside of London, we are looking at expansion in all of the major cities. So any beyond those six, any that you that you can name, and we're actually going up to Scotland, over to Ireland. So it's it's a pretty broad um, expansion. And the, the other thing I would say is some of these major cities like Manchester, Birmingham, for example, a bit like London, it's not only about one site. So we have one site there at the moment. We're going to pop down where the, where the population is big enough and when there's sufficient demand, we'll think about different parts of the city and having more than one site. So that's also something that we think about in these in these localities. Great. I suppose, I suppose, I suppose uh, two questions. I suppose. Hamish, from your point of view, has what are your, have you, has this surprised you from what they've said today? Um, have you been? Uh, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably filled in a few gaps um, with regards to my knowledge of Deliveroo and the models that you're, you're currently offering and working, working with. Um, I think just from, from a sort of, uh, you know, our clients, you know, in, in sort of major corporates and, and people like that. Now, a lot of their focus post-pandemic is actually how they can support smaller local businesses. Um, and I just I just sort of have a, have a concern that, you know, this, this whole tension between large brands, you know, the five guys and, and things like that, and the small local operators that, you know, have perhaps suffered more than some of the large brands is going to be something that, that is going to be a, a you know, a challenge for, for the business model, um, uh, you know, and, and it'd be really nice to sort of think how you could incorporate 
supporting some of the local brands because what they've suffered from is having to close down yep. because, you know, they, they've lost the, the lease because they can't afford the payments. And, and this is sort of you could create some space in those dark kitchens for them to get back on their feet uh, might be a really interesting sort of yeah, it's a, it's thing a good, to look at. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really good point. And so let me, let me touch on it in a couple of ways. One is, um, one is actually we've had, so within outside of London, more so within our rest of UK locations, we actually... What we found is like uh, Shake Shack and, and Dishoom can, can to some degree, and these big brands to some degree do transfer over. But actually you then also have regional brands. So let me take in, um, in Manchester, there was a sushi brand called Zumu, not very well known. We've then grown them to, to five sites. Uh, there's, a, there's a brand called VIP Pizza, which will be known very well to people who live in Brighton. We've grown them to three sites. So these, this local regional expansion um, where we can find brands that, that do well, that are interested in regional expansion, we're definitely open to it. Um, and then, and I think even more so as we grow in the rest of the UK or outside London with, with in, in some of these other cities, and we're putting, you know, 10, 15, 20 kitchens down, we're not going to fill all of those kitchens with blockbuster brands. It's just not, there are, there just aren't enough of those blockbuster brands. And, and frankly, not all of those resonate. And, and like you say, we want some diversity in our, in our offer. So there is definitely, um, we're definitely looking at how do we think about what we call local heroes or local golds in that, in that area that are looking to expand or, you know, maybe already operate in one part of Portsmouth that want to move to a different part of Portsmouth. And, and so, so that is, that is an, it, I, I should have mentioned it that, that earlier. That is an important part of our expansion strategy as well. Good. That's, inter that's interesting. Vicky. Yes. Um, I was at, as it happens at Silverstone on Sunday and, um, we, where we were, where we were watching from, we were surrounded by banks of people, but the view was great, but the service, the facilities where we were at that stage were not the best. Great food courts all over the place. And there were so many people around us saying, gosh, I wish there was a delivery here or wish we could just order something in. Uh, Silverstone's a bit of an odd example, I guess, because that would have to be a, a one almighty pop-up version. Um, but I wonder whether there could even be a model in the future that looks at something like the NEC or a fixed leisure attraction yep. where you've got a huge range of different solutions in one place, yep. but actually really difficult to get them to the people who need them when they want them. Maybe that's another area for consideration. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, so you'd be surprised at how, how much we're already talking to some of these brands about how we can do this. And, and you're right, because when you're, you've got a massive captive audience right in in that stadium um and no one wants to get up from their seat and go and queue in a line for ages and frankly they also want great food and so can we can we either take um some of the existing food counters and 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 change the brands that are in there or do we pop down a separate edition site um that that then you can you can you know get delivery from order on an app get it and it gets delivered to your seat these are some of the things and, and maybe that site can then also deliver to consumers outside of the stadium as well these are some of the things that um is definitely a very viable proposition and and something that we are we are open to and so i think as we sort of as i mentioned earlier this like model of evolution will change and our traditional view of having an industrial estate that services customers alone I think will evolve over the years and things like hotels or big NEC stadiums or things like that will become a bigger part of our portfolio for sure. We, we definitely have the flexibility from the physical perspective to adapt really easily. And so um, we have the expertise internally and externally at, at a partner level, but also obviously at, at the build level and the property level that we can, that we can take advantage of most opportunities. Yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how a model like yours can start to challenge. I mean, I can think of a number of situations with some of my clients at the moment where actually what you're doing, God forbid, could remove some of the element of, of catering services supply. Sorry, Hamish. <laughs> I shouldn't say that out loud. I don't want to yeah, comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Thank you. I mean, that's what's really interesting is how many models will change and adapt anyway as it comes. So it's, it's going to be a fascinating period. I suppose the one question we haven't asked and we haven't really covered off is how you're different to other dark kitchen operators. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a good question. It's something that um, if, you, if you 
remember back to my my first point on, on how the delivery only kitchens operate and we said that you have the landlord that provides the, the space the real estate you then have the delivery only kitchen providers that then construct the site and think about site depth design layout etc that essentially provide the kitchen infrastructure you have the restaurant partners making the food and then you have the third party apps delivering most traditional dark kitchen operators operate in that second segment so they're the ones building the kitchens and providing that infrastructure um we're actually playing across more elements of that and so we're we're We'd, we'd, but given, given we're part of the delivery wider ecosystem, we're actually working alongside delivery on, on and, and, and we get the benefits of scale and growth that comes with, with delivery. So if you're a third party independent kitchen provider, you don't have access to the customer data that we do. And that means that you're not as well equipped to help restaurant partners figure out what's the right locations they need to go into. If you're a third party kitchen operator, you don't have the ability to to rank these restaurants as highly on on the real on the app real estate which we do and so the volume that's generated for these restaurants is not going to be as great as 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 the volume that we can generate um the other thing is the unit economics for additions um if you if you batch orders is actually very strong and we we realize that that um by being sort of an end-to-end -end operator we're able to realize the benefit in those unit economics and we're able to share that benefit with our restaurant partners if you only operate in the delivery if you're a third party delivery only uh, kitchen provider you don't have that um so there, there's a lot of benefits that come with being a part of the marketplace um that is unique to additions when compared to, to other delivery only providers the other piece i would say is like we've been in this business for five years and we've got the warts and the scars that come with it and so we have really learned how do you and I, and I can't I can't overplay this point enough. How do you how do you build a delivery only kitchen that works? Because imagine I mean, imagine days like today. It's like a baking hot outside chefs. I mean, you're, you're in a small kitchen. You, you don't want to be overheating. You, you know, if it's a Friday night or a Saturday night, that the order volume coming through that site is is crazy. You need to set up the site design in a way that makes sense. And that's why we have this dispatch area so that everything is funneled through there. We've got the right technical equipment in our sites that can just handle significant amounts of volume. We spend a lot of time thinking about staff welfare, about making sure that the the, the chef welfare is really important. We have, you know, we, we spend a lot of capex on making sure that the environment is right. We make sure that there's tempered air, and you know, it's 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 um it's a great environment for our chefs to operate in. And, and we don't cut corners, frankly, uh, because it's important for our most quality obsessed restaurant partners to want to come into our sites. And that I think really sets us apart from from many many. Um, competitors out there in the market i mean listening to what you said earlier one of your biggest journeys and going back to lucy's point is about how you build trust and relationships across the sectors isn't it? Yep. and with communities and building it with communities must have been quite a hard journey how do communities welcome you in yeah it's are, a, they, are they very nervous yeah it's a it's it's a really and it's it's like you say it's a really important part of of what we do because we want to be this is not a one-year two-year project for us this is a a, a structural advantage that we want to bring to our communities um so we do i mean i think by and large we spend a lot of time thinking through on, on our site we have operational management plans for example so we make sure that when it's peak hours we just don't have riders going everywhere and we have very clear you know entrances exits protocols for our riders we make sure that rider waiting area is inside our sites rather than having them all congregate outside like these are some of the small things that actually drive annoyances for people around us or, or or local communities that we make sure that we don't um we don't we don't incur i mean if you look at some of our sites like swiss cottage it's pretty much all e-vehicles or e-bikes so we're really thoughtful on like you know green policies and how do we how do we um support those we put electric charging vehicles stations into into our site so there's a lot of stuff that we do with councils with communities to make sure that we're actually adding value beyond just the delivery service and beyond the content that we provide we're actually adding value to to people in those in those um localities and we're not a nuisance this is interesting isn't it it is about how you build the trust you come a long way though haven't you very quickly That's yeah cool. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely something that we we have learned and we have spent 
it, it's something that we spend a lot of time on. And if you if you look at some of the sites that we look at, there's a lot of sites that we say, no, we can't do this. And there's a lot of sites that our competitors would take. And we're just like, nope, it's too close to residential or um, we can't manage the rider flow. Like the, the, the environment doesn't allow us to manage the rider flow appropriately. And so it would just create nuisance for residents lo- uh, close by. And, and, these, we, and we will actively turn down sites because of this. And we know that our competitors will take those sites. And so we're re- we try to be really, really thoughtful because we want to set the standard on what delivery kitchens can do, um, both, for our, both for our restaurant brands, but also for, for our local communities. And I think particularly in, like, in the UK is that we have the largest estate in, in, in this space. And so that we naturally have more learnings, right? Uh, and we see our competitors making mistakes that we made four years ago. Um, and like Mira says, is that we've we've got such a um, our due diligence now that goes into that very early stage from a site selection perspective, um, and what we what we what we feel is a uh, would be a viable site from every level. That the core part of that and that very first stage gate is all about that community piece. And are we going to be that good neighbour? Um, regardless of what, it could be an amazing site for us from a catchment perspective and or you know a build or a property perspective it could be an amazing deal but you know what if we if we're not going to be a good neighbor uh we reject it hands down yep i understand that completely um final questions as we reach the final few minutes lucy vicky hamish any final questions good well look can i say thank you it's been a fascinating presentation by both of you i really enjoyed it actually um, and actually, it's, it's, it's interesting how far you've come and actually how far you've got to go. It, it is going to be an interesting journey to watch. So look, my thanks to both of you today. It's been absolutely great. And I look forward to speaking to you all to get, uh, again in the future. And my thanks to everyone who's listening as well. I look forward to, look forward to speaking to you as well in the very near future. Have, have a great day. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, guys. Thank you. Good to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye.